So as an admitted aging baby boomer, we love to think that technology began somewhere around the time of our birth, and most of the good stuff probably came because as adults, we created it. But I think back to what my grandparents probably experienced. Born in the late 1800s, when long distance calling meant shouting across the holler, horsepower was one horse buggy, nothing flew except for birds, and candle power was really what they used to light themselves. All of those things changed dramatically with true disruptive technologies. Not only did they see telephones and long distance calling and push button phones, but even cellular communications. 440 horses under the hood, rocket ships to the moon, Manhattan floodlit, and all the lights of Broadway. I wonder sometimes how they survived. If there's anything that we can, in fact, still cling to as our own creation, it probably begins with computing. Born in the 1950s, it really grew pretty quickly, but primarily focused on the needs of business and scientists. So if you look at the next even 20 years, computing was something that happened somewhere else, but not something that touched our lives. Then this happened. And we really thought that the future was now arrived, and that all that stuff that we used to see in Future World and in Epcot would be coming to our lives on a daily basis. And it began with all of that promise. But you know, I have to say, within five or six years, you began to see personal computing assuming the same tasks that mainframes used to, and focused on business needs, word processing, database management. So the hope was what? That this might be the game changer, because this brought computing to everyone. You didn't need to have an expensive PC or an expensive uh, wireless fiber optic service or cable service for the internet to your home. Now everyone, for the price of what they used to pay for telephone service, has internet connectivity and a world of apps at their disposal. It really is, to a large extent, what the Model T did to automotive, the, P, the, the PDA, and the iPhone is the start of that genre, really brought for computing. But that's really only the tip of the iceberg. Because once you have that device, what you really have now is access to all the information in the world. It's not just the thing that you hold in your hand. It's that fourth generation, five megabit streaming capacity that connects you to all of the other computers in the world to resources like thinking machines, like the Weston computer that won on Jeopardy, distributed sensor systems, all of those things now become available to you, what we generically call the cloud. And that becomes then something that gives you enough market penetration, enough users, even in niche markets, that you can begin to see the possibility of innovation to touch all aspects of our lives, not just the routine business operations. And if there's any business that needs help, Lord knows it's the world of healthcare. Our nation is arguably two and a half times more expensive than any of the 13 other industrialized nations in the world with respect to what we put into healthcare, and it continues to rise faster and faster. Fortunately, we're waking up to this. And although buried in the debates about healthcare in the United States, which is focused largely on insurance, buried in there has been a close to a $20 billion investment to move physicians and hospitals from paper-based records into electronic medical record systems. Now, that's only the start, much like the PC was only the start of a change. But once we do that, in a sense, we've filled in the pothole of the road to success that allows us to tie physicians to people, to medical devices, to all sorts of clever things that really can fundamentally transform the way we do business and the way we do medicine in a way that's both cost-effective and better healthcare. You go around that ring, we even have the, uh, the concept of highly portable, highly intelligent medical sensor technology. That picture is a real CAD drawing of an invention by one of our students. In fact, our impresario today, Kevin Lee. Right, Kevin, are you here in the audience? Take a bow. <clears throat> Kevin, working with his, uh, his, his advisor and, and the uh, dean of the school, uh, Tom Dewan, have created a optical technology that can measure your blood glucose without a needle stick. So by wearing that ear cuff, you're actually able to determine your blood glucose levels and broadcast that. So not only do you know it, but so does your doctor know it and anyone else who's concerned with your health care. Now, of course, that's an engineering drawing. Hmm? All due respect to engineers, it needs a little creativity. And we do, in fact, in this university, have a design department so we can put the D together with the T and TED. And what you get is a little bit of bling. It's also a medical device. 
So imagine, you get to show your colors. You can have matching lobes and cuffs. There's all kinds of inventive things that you might imagine doing. Didn't Judy say to shut off the phones? Why is there always someone that needs to share their ringtone? I mean, it's really, uh, wait a minute, wait a minute. That someone would be me. Uh, it's my doctor. I got to take this call. What's up, doc? What's up? What's up is your blood glucose level. Dangerously so. I see that you just activated your ear cuff, and the data stream has me concerned. Take a look. Well, Doc, I, I don't know why. I've been sticking to the plan. I really want to do this rather than sticking my finger every day. You gave me a new diet, and I stuck with it. Can you show me what you've eaten today? Well, sure. Let me punch that Dr. up. Dr. Valentino, to the OR, please. I don't Dr. see anything Valentino, entered since your last OR, meal. Please. Are you sure you haven't had anything since then? Well, I, I did need to take something before I went on stage here so I can keep my energy up. Let me key that in for you. Hold on a second. Enter cola, search. Select the last entry. Jolt Cola. Good choice, Don. You really need to review your dietary guidelines, or the next time I see you will be in the ER. All right, Doc, I hear you. The data stream from your ear cuff is showing that your glucose level is coming back down, so you're safe for now. Still, that one drink shouldn't have caused you to spike this badly, so let's review your meds. I know. I have you on saxagliptin, and that works for most of my patients, but not all of them, so let's see what else might work for you. All right. Your record shows a new genomic profile from the L'Oreal labs in Lambden. If you give me access to the results, I can run some analytics to see if there's something better for you. Of course, that's why I had it done. I'm running your history through the Hal Weston computer now. It should only take a second. I see you're a candidate for metformin. I found that to be very effective with other patients when saxagliptin has not worked, so I'm glad it fits your profile. I'm emailing you a fact sheet on the drug now. Okay, good, I got it. I can write you a prescription so you can start using it tomorrow. Shall I send it to your usual pharmacy? Well, that's going to be a problem, Doc. I've got to catch a plane for China immediately after this talk. I'm going to be staying in Beijing. That's no problem. Where are you staying? Well, I'm going to be at the Park Wyatt Hotel. It's uh, kind of in the center of the city, close to the Forbidden City. I found it. Let's see if there's a pharmacy close to your hotel. Tong Ren Tang, that's a big national chain and they're in your network. Here are the walking directions from your hotel. Let me catch those. And here's a picture, you can't miss that storefront. Well, I guess you're right about that. <laughs> if you have any discomfort, please message me right away. I have an old friend from medical school whose practice is in Beijing. In fact, I think his office is in the same complex as the pharmacy. Yes, see? If you agree to share your records, I can set up the referral now, and I'll have your information in case of an emergency. Well, Doc, if you trust him, I trust him, and I'd rather not be out there all on my own with a brand new round of medication. So, yes, I will select him as an uh, alternate provider. While I'm looking at your record, I see you're overdue for a podiatric exam. Can we schedule that while I have you on the line? Doc, <laughs> I got hundreds of people here in the audience, and who knows how many streaming, but I do like my feet, so all right. I have Dr. Bloom's appointment calendar online with yours now. Let's find the earliest opening that works for both of you. Can I confirm that? Yeah, please. Let's do that and uh, lock it in. All right, then. Please keep the cuff on while you're away so I can monitor your progress. I have another patient spiking, so I've got to go. Have a safe trip, and watch what you eat. He's a good doc, isn't he? <laughs> what is this? Excuse me again. Ni <laughs> hao. <laughs> And that's as far as my Chinese goes, so now I'm in trouble. Uh, Sarah? Uh, Sarah, will you activate the TalkTrans utility 
and select English to Mandarin real-time translation. Hello, Dr. Dunn. This is the Tong Ren Tan Pharmacy in Beijing. Hi, how are you doing? You calling about my prescription? We will have your prescription ready for pickup when you arrive in Beijing tomorrow. Good. I'll be there about uh, 9 o'clock your time. Your information shows Horizon Blue Plus is your insurer. There will be a 100 yuan co-payment. I'm not exactly sure how much that is, but you've got my Amex uh, on file in the record there, so please just charge it so I can have that ready tomorrow. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye, Jen. Well, <clears throat> I'm glad to see that everybody got paid. Doc got paid, the pharmacy got paid. So hopefully all's well that ends well. So, now, uh, Mom, I love you dearly, but I'm afraid this one's going to have to wait. Well, so some of that was the E in Ted. Yeah. But everything you saw is technologically feasible. In fact, a lot of it in practice already today. But the pieces haven't been put together. And why is that? Again, because we have allowed healthcare to remain almost like the handcrafting of automobiles from the early 1900s before we put it together the assembly line processes of Henry Ford. So we have manual paper-based processes, serial and sequential processes. The whole system needs to be re-engineered, and that's why a school like this takes on a challenge like that. Once you start looking at the block drawing diagram of how things flow, you can re-engineer and speed up those processes, not to get rid of them, but by using information technology as a way of speeding it up. And if there's anything in this whole scenario that really ought to be and is not, it's the personalization of this activity. Not seven different medical records, of Don's primary care physician, his endocrinologist, his pharmacies, his podiatrist, his ophthalmologist, my medical record. My medical record that I grant permission to other people to share in and use. And the technology is certainly there today to do it and to secure it, and in the process, get us involved on a daily basis. That app for tracking diet, that's a real app. So, you know, tracking calories and, 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 and exercise, balance, that takes a tackle at the number one thing that differentiates us from most of the other civilized nations. That's our battle with obesity. So we have the opportunity to get ourselves personally involved. We have the opportunity to re-engineer the business processes so that DOS can do this and do it and actually save money and provide better care. And then we have the chance to leapfrog into all sorts of imaginative clinical delivery of services. And, you know, I talked about the IBM Watson on Jeopardy. They get it. IBM is already working on figuring out how to use that sort of technology of open database searches, of open free, uh, uh, open uh, natural language processing, unstructured records, not just for winning at Jeopardy, but for winning against cancer, for winning against all sorts of states of disease. That's where the big promise comes, and that's one very important way in which we can demonstrate that the world of information everywhere can be more than just clever toys, faster spreadsheets, personal automation and tracking, and we can begin to do the things for medical delivery that we can do even for shopping at home. And perhaps someday if we do that successfully, when we pick up the phone and the doc's too busy, he'll say, take two apps and call me in the morning.